This month, there's less hardware and software news than usual. However, instead, we have something new to announce, a new platform for developers called DevZone. But there still is some good hardware and software news to report, so let's get into it. Big thanks to Luke Azarzinski, JF, Clover, Dank12, Peter, Martine, and Brian for helping with this video. Also, if you want more content about open source hardware and software, check out my channel, Pete's Loving Nerd. This is the video version of the community update, so this does not have as many details as the blog post, but this video will give you a synopsis, so let's get into it. Housekeeping this month focuses specifically on one topic, a new developers portal called DevZone. In recent months, the community of active developers has grown significantly, with Lucas believing that it has quadrupled since 2019. The side effect is people have lost track of who is working on what, and moreover, development is taking place across multiple protocols and platforms, with new contributors having to spend more time looking through logs, finding relevant repos, and figuring out who does what. Our solution to this is DevZone, with applications available to anyone who has interest or experience in software development. This will help us get an overview of active community developers and their interests. This will also help us better understand our community pool to help distribute prototype devices to the right people without spending hours figuring out who's right for them. We have a backlog of ideas stalled because of the component shortages, and we would like to get the show back on the road as soon as the world reverts to normal. People granted developer status will receive access to knowledge and information sharing prototype. People granted developer status will receive access to a knowledge and information sharing platform with early prototype data, pre-release schematics, development resources, and an overview of ongoing development. Some information available on the platform will even include things that we don't share publicly. Those whose submissions will be accepted will also be given a development status on all of our platforms. On to Pine Time. Let's start with some good news about production. Production of the new batch is going well, and if everything goes to plan, single sealed units should be available by the time you watch this video. These watches come with the newest version of Infinitime and its bootloader, so it's ready to go from the get-go. The new 1.2.0 release of Affinitime adds support for the new accelerometer that we are shipping because of the component shortage, and it has a new metronome application, improves the stopwatch app, and brings many improvements and bug fixes. We also worked on memory optimizations that freed lots of RAM and ROM memory, which will allow us to add more features in the future. In other Pine Time news, WaspOS have seen a few improvements recently, including a new experimental sports app, a watch face chooser, and bug fixes. And there's also a new pull request recently that adds a more advanced alarm system. We'd also like to welcome a newcomer to the Pine Time firmware world, Molilla by Martin D. Jongs. I butchered that name, I'm sorry. Melilla is a fully featured Riot OS firmware for Pinetime. It uses a grayscale display system and has some initial work done to get a font converter working. As for the future, the plan is he would like to get a GNOME style UI with MicroPython support, support for all the watch's hardware, and 6 LLWPAN networking over BLE. The project is still in its early phases, but it looks very promising, and as a GNOME fan, the concepts for this look amazing, and I'm looking forward to seeing this develop a lot. Next up on the agenda is the Pinephone keyboard. We have been ironing out the rest of the existing issues these past three months, and we are now at a stage where we incorporated most, if not all, the developer feedback for the keyboard's electronics, chassis refinements, and a fine-tuned keyboard membrane. Thanks to Maggie, there is also fully open source firmware for the keyboard that will ship by default. We are very close to production ready, but because of the importance of this peripheral, we want to get it right the first time and have decided on creating one last run of prototypes prior to production in order to incorporate any last minute tweaks that devs request. As long as everything goes to plan, we would immediately start production of them if there are no issues with the final prototype units. In other words, the pre-production back cases for the Pine Phone have just arrived from the factory. The fingerprint and wireless charging modules will be fitted into the cases and undergo functionality and physical endurance testing, and if it turns out both cases fit and function well, then you can expect the production of them to commence shortly. The LoRa back case will have to wait a bit longer while we wait for a developer to bring the chip's functionality to the protocol the case needs, so if you're someone who wants to have a go at it, reach out to us. At any rate, we might even see the back covers introduced at the same time as the keyboard cases, but until then, 
you will see a dedicated post on the blog about the bat cases once production starts, so stay tuned. The big software news of this month is that the PinePhone can now play back accelerated videos. Brian Daniels has been able to get smooth hardware accelerated video playback using DStreamer, which allows for developers to write applications that utilize it, including the new Clapper video player, which can output at 1080p 30fps at ease. In order to get this working, you must compile GStreamer from source. However, Distro should start shipping it once it's in the stable builds of GStreamer. Arch Arm now has a new Plasma build, which is something people have been interested in for some time. The image features Plasma Mobile 5.22, which is the newest version. And you can also download Fosh and a barebones installation image for Arch Arm 2. Aside from Plasma Mobile, Danny made a pull request adding support for the tiling UI. XMO, and you should be able to get your hands on this image by the end of the month. Lastly, PostMarket OS has seen some improvements, including the recent version 21.06 stable release, which includes Fosh 0.11, with Fosh 0.12 being in the Edge builds. The build also received quick suspend and resume support for the modem for those running on the Edge branch, which should increase the reliability of calls and mobile data on the device. With Quartz 64 now available in the Pine Store for early adopters, we will focus on the software progress this month. PG Wipeout has laid out the foundations for mainline Linux on the RK3566 SoC used in the Quartz 64, and the device tree has landed in mainline Linux. Developers are looking for a method to handle the RK3566 and RK3568 split, and once a solution is found, they will be submitting a number of RK3566 specific patches upstream, including the basic device tree for the Quartz 64 Model A. One thing we are missing right now is the VOP version 2 display driver that will allow for display output, although that is still in development. Other key missing components right now include the drivers needed for audio, e-ink displays, and battery driving support. The audio and charging support will take some time, but should be incorporated into the kernel in a timely fashion. However, the e-ink functionality on the other hand may end up being a major challenge. Rockchip is actively working on preparing U-Boot for the RK3566 and has pushed downstream changes to the RAM in it, as well as added RK3566 support in the Make Image program. A complete overview of the progress can be seen on the Quartz 64 wiki page. Finally, there are now multiple operating systems to toy around with. PG Wipeout made a build root recovery image and a Debian installer both of which pack all currently available functionality with the newest commits. Earlier this month, the Quartz 64 was also able to boot Manjaro Linux, which features the same kernel and patches as BuildRoot and Debian, and therefore all the same available functionality. We are happy to announce another device joining the PineDeal family called the PineDeal Stack. This is an all-in-one development platform featuring the Buffalo BL604 SoC, which is almost identical to the BL602 that is currently being open sourced, aside from having more GPIOs. The stack also features an XX1262 LoRa module from WAC Wireless. The stack will allow you to connect peripherals via exposed GPIO and will connect to a small LCD panel, and the entire PCB can be housed inside a sleek plastic case. It can also be operated from a battery, which uses the same charging circuit as the Pine Time. While it was envisioned as a development platform, the stack can also be used for other purposes too, such as a LoRa endnode and the use of solar panels in conjunction with batteries. We know solar paneled endnodes are a highly desired feature, and so we are exploring an in-house solution to that setup. In other news, the PineDio gateway is still awaiting certification as we are missing a part which we are told will be delivered in five weeks. As soon as that part is delivered, we will certify the gateway and proceed with production. As for the PinePhone LoRa base case, the electronics in the case are completed and in theory ready to go. That being said, we are still missing the driver needed to make it work, and we are currently talking to a handful of developers who could be up to the challenge to bring this device driver over. So, if you are someone interested in this, make sure to contact us. That said, that's the end of the video and have a great rest of your month.